Most bankers aren't ready to help you until after their third cup of coffee. But with Central National Bank's after-hours service, you don't have to wait for the bank lobby to open to get help. You can contact us from 6 to 8.30 in the morning or from 5 to 10 in the evening, and we'll connect you to a real, live, local person who can answer questions and fix problems seven days a week. Bank different. Bank central. Central National Bank. Member FDIC. Greetings, Blazer fans, and welcome to the Blazer's Edge podcast. This one is going to post on Saturday. Uh, if you're looking for Joe and Tara in this slot, we're going to bump them over a couple days, probably give them our normal slot, or you'll hear from them soon. But we had a semi-remarkable thing happen in Trailblazer land this week. Uh, that would be uh, Isaac Ropp of CSNNW was dismissed off of Talking Ball and made very clear on radio, on Twitter, uh, what the cause was. That the, that the relationship between the Portland Trailblazers and specifically Neil Olshay and the Portland media might not be the healthiest in the world. Um, we heard what Isaac said. We printed what Isaac said. We want to get uh, a bigger perspective on that. So we're going to have a couple guests on. We are going to have first uh, Isaac himself here in just a second. And after him, we're going to welcome an old friend of ours, uh, Mr. Ben Golliver from SI.com. And uh, they are both going to give us their perspective on Portland media, on the relationship in media and in, in, in sports teams in general, and whether or not there really is such a thing as independent media anymore and what we might expect when we see something written or said about the team. So uh, I am here with Dan Morang. We're going we're gonna to come back to Dan for reflections later. But for right now, let us welcome... Isaac. All right. We are here together with Isaac Ropp. Uh, you are familiar with him from 1080 The Fan, the primetime show from 3 to 7, Twitter account, at IROP. Isaac, I would ask how you're doing, but uh, we've, we've read quite a bit about how you're doing, man. Uh, the, the day after, as we record this, what are your reflections? How are you feeling? Um, and what kind of, actually, let's do this. What kind of response have you gotten so far? Has it been basically positive, skepticism, or, or what? Mostly 95% positive. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was just thinking before I called you how many people, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised by how many people in the media, people, names you would know, other people that I don't really know, haven't talked to, but have reached out. And then, of course, fans and listeners and viewers you know, that have reached out and uh, been very supportive. And as far as how I'm feeling, I, I feel great. I mean, I, I came home last night and told my wife about it. And she said, well, why the hell would you do something like that? And I said, because I'm right. And the people need to know this, and it feels good. You know, I mean, I, I think I think your gut tells you a lot. And my gut feels really clear. My conscience feels clear. Um, it's not about me. This isn't about me or my life. I'll be fine. I'll move on. But it's about what Blazer fans need to know about how they operate. I think it's BS, and I'm, I'm quite frankly, I'm happy I, I called them out on it. Okay, so let's set the table here because I think there, there are people who don't quite understand all the interconnections. Talking Ball right. is on CSNNW, Comcast Sports, basically. How are they related to the Blazers or not? So. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you watch a Trailblazers game, you will get Kevin and Lamar and Brooke on the call, formerly Mike and Mike, and you will get uh, Jordan Kent and Michael Holton. You know, they're in the studio doing pre, uh, halftime, and post. Those guys are all under the Blazers broadcasting umbrella when you watch that. The Blazers control that. That is in-house. That is theirs. And they can manipulate that however they want. And they do. Once you get to talk and ball, if you're watching a game on CSN, once you get to talk and ball, you are now into the territory of the television company, CSN, Comcast. And they control that show. They do the hiring and firing. I was on talk and ball. CSN pays me, not the Blazers. Now, the Blazers have a contract, obviously, that was very controversial. I'm sure you guys talked about it. Uh, that they recently... Uh, re-upped with Comcast, and, and so their games are back on there for, for a certain number of years. And so they are partners. CSN and the Blazers are partners. But where this gets hairy 
is that the Blazers had a had far too much influence on what happens and have far too much influence on what happens once the broadcast goes to any CSM program, any and all CSM programming. And that's my rub here. That's what people need to know. It's not right. I think it mirrors a lot of what's happening in, in our society right now, and it's just it, it, it's wrong. And if I can do my little part to tell people how they operate, I'm going to do it, and that's what I did. So, um, you know, that's generally how the relationship works. Uh, CSN uh, let me go basically because the Blazers put pressure on them, me all shape specifically, to do so based on things that not things that I said, although I don't think they always loved everything I said because I just was honest, but things more on social media. It was, it was more of a, a Twitter battle than anything else. Okay, so to be clear, CSN is theoretically an independent entity from the Blazers and operates that way in terms of claiming the badge of media and et cetera, et cetera. Yes, but they are partners with the Trailblazers, and you better believe that any, not is not just the Blazers, but any franchise that has a partnership with their radio, their flagship radio station or their flagship television station is going to want to have say and influence, and that's, that's very normal. I would expect that. But when you have a person like myself who was told by CSN, uh, by, by the people who fired me, um, that I did not cross the line, and I asked him point blank, did I cross the line? I'm open to it. I mean, we do it all the time. I speak on the radio four hours a day. It happens. And I'm willing to admit if I crossed the line or if I was unfair. And they said no to both and fired me anyway. And that, that is what you need to know is that the trailblazers wield that kind of wand over a broadcast that is not theirs. I'm not paid by them. Uh, that's alarming. That, that should be – that to me, if, if I'm a Blazer fan, that to me – should be uh, a, quite a red flag about how they operate and what they try to control you from seeing and hearing. And CSN, of course, would be, uh, when push comes to shove, if you identify media outlets from which stories break, um, from, I, I don't want to say quite analysis because there are a lot of us who do that, but the, the most inside of the media outlets are almost certainly CSN and W and the Oregonian. And at least one of those you're saying Olshay has interfered in to the point of getting a, a staff member fired, which is, which is concerning if that's at least half your media. Uh, let's get into some of the things that, uh, th that you said here. Now, you've already gone out and said it, that this is an Olshay kind of thing. What do you see as the motivation here behind it? Now, understanding that some people are saying, as you've said, well, it's normal for a corporation to have some interest in it, the way it's portrayed and et cetera, et cetera. What do you see as abnormal, different, or extra about this that makes it noteworthy? Uh, because, because nothing was done that crossed the line. Um, this was about social media. You know, it's funny. What I, what I say on the radio, you know, it locks into the cosmos right after I say it, right? People, people hear it, they digest it, but they move on. With Twitter, you know, it sits there, and it's shared, and it grows like it has a life, depending on how interested it is to people. Like this has, has grown. People are interested in it. So that is why the Blazers are so uh, paranoid. So the things that I tweeted were things, uh, in my opinion, and in pretty much everyone I've talked to, including the CSN executive's opinion, were things that are absolutely within the bounds uh, of criticism watching this team. Look, it's been a bad year. So they're, they're going to be sensitive to these things. But things like, when is the coach's job in jeopardy? When is the GM's job in jeopardy? Willard looks disengaged this year. I listened to interviews, and I think I tweeted that something along the lines of it's easy to draw conclusions, but these guys don't give a rip about what's going on because it's the same lip service garbage after every game. These are all things fans are thinking. And so what, what, what makes this noteworthy is the Blazers should have no control over that. I know they may not like it, but they don't have control over that. And for them to, to push me out because of it, again, not about me, but that's wrong. 
And they think without me tweeting a thought about firing the GM or that Damian Lillard looks disengaged this year, that people will all of a sudden not think that or see it. I mean, they almost, in a sense, think you're stupid. They're going to try to whitewash everything from you, and they, and they just don't have the right to do it. And this is my little corner of the world. I know it's a small thing. It's sports. It's not that big of a deal. But to me, I think fans need to, need to know it. So, in essence, what I hear you saying is because you said something critical about the team, venue with social media, but still legitimately, I mean, no media people don't use social media nowadays. Because you said right. something critical about the team, basically, long story short, you got fired because Neil Olshay didn't like it. Is that a fair, crit a fair summary of what you're saying? That's the way I understand it, and I think I think deeper is perhaps in this new contract that the Blazers signed with their television partner CSN. Perhaps there is something in there that allows the Blazers that amount of control. Now I don't know if that's true. I have heard that that may be true, and that is I I, I'm, I would be stunned to know why CSN, or very interested to know why CSN would sign a deal that would allow that. But it sounds like that may be part of their deal, and that is not right either. Look, it's, like I said before, it's one thing for them to, to have a partnership and voice their concerns over the coverage and come to a common ground of we scratch your back, you scratch ours, let's be fair and honest. But ultimately it's about the consumer, and let's give them what they need. That's one thing. It's another to completely attempt to control it with no checks and balances. So if the Blazers have this level of control, does that then call into question for whom these broad who these broadcasts are serving and who the media is serving? I mean, there are two directions, yeah? I mean, you can serve the people to whom you are reporting or you can serve the people you are reporting on, and those two often end up being very different. Uh, no question. You no question. Yeah. Just, let me just let me just say Go this, ahead. Dave, before you get to your next question. I, this I've been in this market for 17 years. I've been at this same radio station for 15, and I've been on the same show for 12. We've been very successful. Whether you like me or not, I know what I'm talking about. I've observed the media up close for a long time as it pertains to this franchise. And to me, there are three types of media. There's one. Spineless. These are guys trying to catch a paycheck. They're not that smart. They're easily intimidated or they're scared. And the team doesn't need to worry about them, and they don't. Many of these people are fanboys anyway. They grew up loving the team, and they won't call them out, whatever. Two, they're guys who people like old Shea get in their hip pocket. These are, these are the types that get one-sided information from the organization, and it makes them feel better because they have his number in their phone, and they feel important, but they're pawns and they're under control. And then there's the third type, and these are people who do not give a shit about them. They care about their audience, their viewers, their listeners, their readers, much like I think you guys operate. And they try to be true to them by being as honest as they can through the relationship that they have and based on what they see when they watch. Sometimes it can be uh, just, uh, I don't want to say disturbing, sometimes it can be, some people don't like it that way. They, they want the fluff. But typically... That it's unfiltered, it's informed, and it's honest. And particularly in a year when it's a damn year and things are going south, you better believe sometimes it's going to be negative. So in this town, in my opinion, in my observations over the years, there are a ton of ones, a ton of them. There are quite a few number, uh, there are quite a few twos, and there are very few threes. So when you get a three, you better believe that Neil O'Shea or whomever over there, because it's not just him, this is how the organization has operated since day one, they're going to freak out because when he does a bad job, like he did this offseason, the threes are going to tell the truth about it. And markets need threes. And unfortunately, one of my biggest gripes about this market, and I love this market, and I love our listeners, and, I, and I, I don't, we're not going anywhere, Soup and I. We love it. But this market needs more threes. Describe the market a little bit, the environment. The, uh, the, uh, let's narrow it down. You, you said some things in your in your audio tweet that were pretty profound about the the media environment and your empathy for people in it. If you were to 
to describe the Trailblazers' media environment right now in, in a few sentences, how would you describe it? The, the emotion of it, it the as, feeling of it, the, yeah. It is, um, that's a good question. Um, it is paranoid, short-sighted, and reactionary. It always has been, and it is controlled to a point that is not right. I mean, that's those are short, and it's as short as I can get. Yeah, and it, a little, I mean, scary. I mean, we should think about that. Now, uh, you know, the natural reaction to some of this stuff is for people to point out motivations of the messenger and et cetera, et cetera, and, and fine. At the same time... Sure. When when someone wants when someone takes the risk to step out and say something like that, who otherwise has a track record, uh, it behooves all of us to listen. Uh, before we let you go, we would be remiss <laughs> in not asking you the same question about Neil Olshay. A lot of your a lot of your quotes last night were about him. We we've, we've left that for last because that's it's part of the point, but it's kind of not the point. This is not Rop versus Olshay. This is Rop trying right. to to say something, but. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you the same question about Olshay. Uh, it, you know, three or four sentences, however, well, you have the floor. How would you describe what is your impression of Neil Olshay? Well, I mean, you know, I, I, I think that he is uh, thin-skinned. I think that he is in an environment. Uh, the Vulcan Paul Allen environment has always been this way. It is, uh, it is, a, he is an environment that breeds self-preservation. And he is a guy, he's an, you know, he's an East Coast uh, New York guy, uh, also spent time in L.A. He's an L.A. New York guy. He's a no BS guy. In a lot of ways, I respect that about him. I, I, I like people like that, but um, because they're, they're straight shooters. However, um, I think that he is too thin-skinned. I think that he is uh, he's a lot like our new president in that he clearly cannot handle criticism, and he oversteps his bounds when he hears it. He's got to be able to handle it better. And quite frankly, I think he's out to save his job because uh, he's on the road. He's done a bad job. I mean, this this team, he's a good evaluator of talent. There's no question about that. But this team, when it was winning last year and making a playoff run, was one of the youngest in the league, <clears throat> up and coming, and had the, some of the, most, the, the biggest amount of cap space in the league. One year later, he hands out all these bad contracts, and all of a sudden, they're a sub-500 team with the second-highest payroll. Now, how in the hell in Portland is he going to rectify that? That's on him. That's his to own. And when people call him out on it uh, to answer your question about how what he's like, he cannot handle a uh, freeze in this market calling him out on it. And that, that's it. And it's short-sighted. I mean, I, I'm still on CSN Day. I mean, the the network the Blazers have a partnership with, I'm on there Monday through Friday for four hours. So they essentially fired 10% of me. It's ridiculous. And so um, this is how he operates. He just can't see the forest through the trees. And I think that this organization has always operated like that because it's a one-horse town, and they feel like they can get away with it, and they always have. All right. Well, I mean, there you have it. And thank you, Isaac, for sharing that with us. Um, you, you all can catch Isaac again on 1080 The Fan, prime time, 3 to 7, uh, Twitter at IROP. And uh, we will be paying attention. We'll, we'll listen. And uh, again, thanks for your, well, courage in saying this, because not a ton of people, I think a lot of people are probably feeling the way you do, but very few people say it. And uh, we certainly hope things go well for you. Well, I appreciate it, Dave. I appreciate the platform. Uh, I there are a lot of people. I was like I said at the outset of this. I was really surprised at how many people in the media and outside of the media, prominent people, reached out to me about this. It's interesting. This is like an underlayer that just doesn't get talked about. And if I could say just one other thing, Dave, I know you got to wrap it up, but um, please, this please. is this is the main point. But yeah, this is the main point about this franchise. I believe they live in a bubble. And the reason they live in a bubble is because they're the only major sports show in town. They have sponsors. They have season ticket holders. They have fanboys who are going to do anything to suck up to them and be a part of what they do, period. 
Because of that, this franchise gets an overinflated sense of itself, and they never observe outside that bubble. And what is happening outside of that bubble is people are not fooled. They see the franchise for what it is. It's a run-of-the-mill franchise in a market that's impossible to acquire star players short of drafting them in a league that's watered down, and they don't want to consume their product. And if the Blazers would spend more time focusing on how to grab more of those people and being honest about what they are, I think they would be much better off than fighting little Twitter Twitter battles with uh, some radio host. There you have it, folks. (laughs) Isaac Roth, pulling no punches and uh, telling it like it is. We appreciate your time, Isaac. Dave, thank you so much. Absolutely. And now, folks, uh, we've come out of the frying pan and into the deep fryer because uh, joining us is an old friend, the first time that he and I have actually reunited publicly. Uh, so welcome back to the, uh, the Ben and Dave show. Uh, ben Golliver is with us from SI.com, of course, at Ben Golliver on Twitter, uh, also at The Crossover and all that great stuff. Uh, ben, w- welcome back, buddy. <laughs> Dave, it's been far too long. It's good to hear your voice, but as tends to happen, tragedy brings us together, huh? <laughs> tragedy <laughs> of a sort, I suppose. Um, we wanted to get your perspective on this. You were one of the uh, national people who had something to say about this and would actually come on air, so uh, bravo for that. And um, so I just want to ask you, of course, you were with Blazer's Edge for 6.5, 7 years, and during that time you operated in the Portland media environment. Since that time you have gone national and operate in a national media environment. So we want to ask you a few questions about this um, whole Blazer's media organizational thing. Um, what was your experience like in Portland when you were here, when you were credentialed for Blazer's Edge? Uh, what, what were things like? What was the environment? I think the most important takeaway is that an individual's personality uh, within the organization can go a long way to shaping things for almost everybody who comes into contact with it. Uh, For example, when we first started at Blazer's Edge, uh, we were one of the first websites anywhere, kind of independent um, voices, you know, with a fairly regular track record of being, you know, critical or at least not, always positive that was able to get credentialed and get in the building. And, and I think that started with the leadership that was there uh, during that time period. Uh, Then, you know, you get to sort of the Larry Miller era and there was a lot of kind of confusion, um, which I think, you know, in some part was due to his personality of coming from a more corporate background, not caring so much about the PR side of it. Uh, You know, thinking that, Oh, things will just blow over and it's not a big deal. And, um, and, and maybe just having different priorities in terms of what he was looking to do. Uh, and, and then you get to this current era and, you know, with Neil Olshay, I mean, it was a very clear and, and strong turn once he was put into that position in terms of, uh, you know, things as simple as restricting access at practice, you know, not allowing uh, writers to go to a certain part of the gym, tightening up how long the periods were in terms of how you could get uh, you know, interview sessions, um, you know, restricting in some cases assistant coaches from talking to the media. Uh, and so a lot of those things to me, you know, again, it goes back to the personalities of the decision makers in terms of uh, what do they view as their priorities and, and how stable of ground are they on? Um, you know, one thing that we learned early on was that, you know, when they're trying to sell tickets, you know, when they're not doing so well in the standings, um, it does make sense to let in, uh, you know, online websites or explore new uh, media members as being part of the quote unquote official credentialed club, because that can be a very effective sales and, and marketing uh, weapon. And you see that around the league too, uh, you know, as the team gets better and, and the decision makers maybe have more to lose, so to speak, uh, a lot of times, you know, that will kind of ebb and flow and, and access might get uh, a little harder to get for, for new voices. So, uh, that's sort of the overall big picture view. When I look back at uh, Blazers Edge in Portland, it was uh, it's driven a lot by the people who are in charge. So, what you're saying kind of is that uh, from from the team standpoint, the media, the view of media is less 
Oh, institution, sacred institution, letting the public know, or two-way street relationship, and more. How can I use this to further my goals? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it kind of depends. Okay, so when we first started, uh, you know, all the same people pretty much who are the PR people at that point, almost 10 years ago now, are almost the same PR people now. And, and I can almost think of those 10 years in different eras in terms of, okay, this was like a good period uh, of happy relations. This was maybe a more strained period uh, of more tense relations. And, and usually it boils down to uh, who's in charge. And uh, I guess my big takeaway from like the shift towards, uh, you know, Neil's time uh, was that they knew the roster was going to undergo a lot of change. And he came in with the idea of like overhauling a lot and really cleaning out a lot of the front office people, uh, you know, and McGowan was right there on the business side, kind of doing the same thing. I mean, kind of purging in some cases, you know, some high, higher salaried employees and, and really trying to cut down their, uh, their business organization uh, and, and bring in some new people that he had worked with previously at the top. And when you make those kinds of, uh, you know, life altering decisions for a lot of people. I mean, there's dozens of employees involved, pretty much the entire roster turned over in like three years. Uh, you know, in a small community like Portland, where pretty much everybody knows everyone. And a lot of those people had been working there for decades. That's going to, you know, incite a lot of negative response. And so I think both Olshay and McGowan went into their jobs, understanding that there was going to be uh, significant pushback, from either the community uh, or just, you know, former employees. Uh, and they had to kind of be proactive about it in terms of how do we manage the media relations side of this so that this doesn't, you know, wind up making us look like the bad guys. And uh, I think McGowan kind of started off a little bit rockier than Olshea. I mean, his first press conference, and he looked really unprepared and nervous and wasn't ready to go. And he was delivering all this bad news and, uh, they were trying to get through the sellout streak and all of these things. And uh, I think it, it, one thing you can credit Olshe for is like, well, he knew it was about to come and he made sure he kind of got his message out early. And there was enough people who were willing to kind of go along with it and not dissent that it was kind of able to kind of carry the day a little bit. And the dissenters, uh, you know, were kind of left on the outside and that's kind of a recurring theme I think you're seeing again now. Do you, there's, it's been said that uh, the more you can reflect the organization's message, A, the easier the access is, obviously, uh, the, the closer you get to your sources, uh, the more credibility you get and the easier time you're going to have. Obviously, that, that makes sense in a, in a homely, homespun way. In sports media, how how much does that rule the day nowadays? I mean, is there independence? Is there true independence? Or in what ways are, do we have healthy dependence? Is there unhealthy dependence? Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, reporters and journalists are getting it from all sides right now. I mean, it's not just people in power who are kind of squeezing uh, the vice grip and asking you know, or expecting more one-sided coverage or, or more positive coverage. But you also have competitors that are, you know, athlete-driven enterprises like the Players' Tribune, where, you know, they're, that's going to be friendly. You know, it's not even really media, but consumers, you know, treat that like it's media. Uh, you know, you've, you've got, you know, team-created content, which is, you know, getting better and better, honestly, in terms of the quality of it and, uh, the, you know, the, the quantity of it too, you know, teams are really committing to that stuff far more than they did five years ago. So that's competition. And so uh, people in power are viewing this landscape and they're saying, well, we don't need writers and journalists in the same way they might've needed them 15 or 20 years ago when there was less options for consumers to get news about the team that they care about. So it's trickier and trickier to be critical. And, you know, it's a constant trade off. I mean, if you want to be someone who is a truth teller, uh, and, you know, accurately in your eyes, subjectively, uh, or, or sorry, objectively, you know, assess grades and, and you know, provide grades and give uh, reactions to trades and uh, signings and everything. Uh, I mean, 
you're facing more and more pressure uh, from all different sides to not, you know, to, to kind of be polite about it, at least, you know, at bare minimum, if not, uh, you know, just not be gushing with praise. I mean, you see all the time, you know, these moves uh, are received by the local media so much more uh, positively or optimistically uh, than they are by the national media. And there's, you know, strong reasons for that. And also what you see is a lot of, uh, Bias by omission, you know, people who are rather than be critical of moves, uh, you know, keep people might just be quiet about a bad move if they know it's a bad move so that they don't jeopardize the relationship with the person who might have made it because they might that executive or uh, whoever it would be, you know, down the road. So this is not just something that's new unique to Portland. I think it happens everywhere in professional sports. It happens, you know, at the league level. Uh, it's a really tricky, you know, dance to do. And the, the toughest part in Portland is that uh, I think everybody knows everybody, right? And there's um, less options. So, you know, if everybody depends on the Blazers for their sort of, you know, financial health, whether that's, you know, the paper, you know, selling ads to the team or, uh, you know, getting a lot of subscribers based on their coverage of the team or, whether that's the radio stations kind of fighting each other for the right to be the official station, whether that's the TV deal where like the station pretty much exists only as a, uh, a forum for, for Blazers uh, conversation and analysis in the case themselves. Uh, I mean, that's really tricky. Everybody's dependent, you know, everybody kind of answers to the same, uh, to the same source. So uh, I think some markets that are bigger that have more competing options among teams um, have, just more media outlets, you know, say whether it's more sports radio stations, more television stations that are providing regular sports coverage uh, and so on. It's probably a healthier uh, because there's a little bit more of a, a buffer from things getting personal. Um, but yeah, you know, if, if you're the GM of the Blazers or the president of the Blazers, I mean, you pretty much need to follow like 20 or 30 people on Twitter. And that's the entire uh, landscape. Uh, if someone has a decision you don't like, or uh, if they had a column that you disagree with, or whatever, uh, there's it's hard for that to get lost in the shuffle. You know, it's not very hard to, to stay on top of everything, uh, and I think that can create unhealthy dynamics. Uh, just because, uh, you know, if you have someone who's not receptive to criticism uh, for any team, you know, whether they're an executive or even a player, um, it's so much easier for, for them in this media environment to shut that voice out and let somebody else fill in the cracks because uh, there's always people who are trying to crack into sports. And there's a, a lot of times there's a lot of people who are willing to be uh, positive, if not glowing in their assessment. Hey, Ben, you kind of touched on something here that I wanted to talk to you about in that the differences between a larger market, say a, a New York, a Boston, or a Los Angeles – that even if they have an in-house media arm, let's take the Yankees for example, and the, and the Yes Network and MSG with 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 the with the Knicks, there's a dividing line between them and the other media in the region, and that healthier concept that, that you're kind of talking about is it on the Blazers to to make that dividing line? Because I, I I feel like when I look at this situation and what's kind of come out of this is that. I think a lot of people in Portland are unaware that where that dividing line really exists in Portland. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, we could all hope that they would have a certain level of respect for the media in general. And we always hope that about our politicians or our people of power. Uh, but when things go south, you know, generally uh, people tend to get more paranoid and the natural you know, human response. I mean, if you're feeling like, uh, things aren't going the way you want, and you're hearing all this negative feedback from everybody. Like it's very natural to want to tune those voices out, and, and I'm sure I do it too. Or whether it's comments or emails or whatever else, I mean, it's very hard not to. Uh, I think you know, just like to use the Blazers as an example. Uh, you know, Neil O'Shea came from the Clippers here in LA, where I am right now, and uh, you know, Chris McGowan comes from uh, like the soccer team, the Galaxy, right? So their jobs down in LA were very much different. Like the galaxy for one, are just trying to get anyone to talk about them ever. Right. And they're trying to kind of do little stunts, be funny on Twitter, uh, just trying to build up their name recognition so they can sell tickets. So 
to a certain degree, any coverage is good coverage if you're the Galaxy, right? Like, you, even if people are kind of, like, mocking your players or whatever, like, at least they're talking about you, and that helps your bottom line. Kind of the same thing with the Clippers, honestly. I mean, as good as the Clippers are right now, um, on, the, on the sports media landscape here in L.A., I mean, they barely rate. You know, everybody still cares about the Lakers way more. The Dodgers are way bigger. They've got these new NFL teams. People are kind of getting excited about that. And so even though the Clippers might be the most successful team in the market, you know, they're like seventh or eighth when it comes to uh, general interest. So, again, even though they've had you know, tons and tons back in the day of, of bad PR and, and not really uh, you know, conducting business the right way, they have to have a certain relationship towards the media because otherwise people just won't even show up to their games and cover them. You know? And what good does that do to their fan base? I mean, it, it gets hard to cultivate a fan base. Now, both those guys go to Portland, and it's completely different, as you guys know. I mean, you're neck deep in Blazers all day long. People are talking Blazers 365 days a year. Uh, the only thing that's even close is probably Oregon football in terms of, uh, you know, year-round interest. And even that is not even close, really, in terms of the size and, and the, the long-standing nature of the fan base. So it goes back to what I was saying earlier about just your dynamics with the media change. I mean, all of a sudden – you don't need the media to do the most fundamental thing, which is help you fill the building most years, especially when the team's pretty good. And especially when the team was really good and really exciting, uh, whether that was last year uh, or, you know, earlier in Scott's tenure when, when things were looking pretty good, uh, you know, Damian's shot in the, in the postseason. I mean, no offense to myself, but nobody really needs to read my take on Damian Lillard's shot, right? They could just watch the vine 5,000 times in a row and, uh, and enjoy the team and, and buy tickets and buy their shirts that way. So, um, the big market versus little market thing uh, gives the, the organization much more leverage in terms of its relationship with the media uh, than it would have if it was in a more crowded space. Uh, and it's not necessarily so much, I don't think about how many people live in Portland. It's just about how many competing options are there for uh, the consumer's dollar. And there, I mean, I was there during the, you know, 05, 06 seasons, uh, you know, I didn't have anything else to do as like a 22, 23 year old young male who likes sports in Portland. So I was still going to those games and there were still people there. I mean, it wasn't full, but as bad as the team was, I'd still go in, and spend the money to watch them play. Um, and they know that, that those kinds of people are always going to be there in Portland. And that if the team is just even decent, uh, they're going to be selling out every single night. So uh, I don't know. I think that's kind of the main difference between. Uh, the large market and the small market. It basically boils down to leverage. So let's get down to brass tacks here. We have a, a claim that a uh, high-ranking team executive uh, influenced a media source that's, well, in partnership with the team, but also theoretically quasi-independent. It's certainly not on the team payroll. Uh, as far as personnel and content, do you find that plausible? Would, does that, would that shock you at all? Uh, yeah, the specifics of that situation, but I think in general, you know, it's best to just not be naive, right? Like if CSN is broadcasting every single game, their executives are in direct negotiations with Blazers executives. Uh, it's a small town like we've mentioned. CSN is not managing like five different professional organizations, right? Like they kind of have one client. It's the Blazers. Uh, and keeping the Blazers happy is basically the only thing keeping them as a station, right? Like if the, if they lost the Blazers coverage, like people were worried about what happens to CSN, you know, I mean, honestly, is that even still a network? Um, and I love the people at CSN. They were very nice to me at the time when I was on the air, you know, some of them I would consider longtime friends, but it's just the realities of the business. Like if, if your entire network is built around one team and that team decides to go a different direction, you're, you're stuck. You're screwed. And so, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a direct thing of, of someone sending a phone call or a text message uh, to, you know, this executive talks to the CSN executive, and that's the decision. Um, th that kind of an influence could play out in all sorts of ways, you know, and there's regular contact between those two. They've made lots of other changes, you know, personnel-wise. Um, and the Blazers, you know, are always going to say, oh, that's an internal CSN decision. That's a CSN decision. Uh, but it's never quite that simple uh, is the way that I would put it. And, 
you know, there are arguments for saying that the Blazers uh, should have an active hand in how their team is put forth to the public. Uh, you know, for me, you know, does having a super homer broadcast crew serve your team's best interest, or is it better to have a more moderate one? I mean, I know those were questions that were being asked inside the Blazers uh, in the top runs of their organization for years. And they put out a survey asking the fans that exact question. <laughs> So, you know, they're very conscious of how they're presented in official channels. And any smart organization, any intelligent uh, professional sports organization would be. I mean, if you just have a crappy broadcast crew, that can really, uh, or not even the broadcast crew, but, you know, a pregame show, postgame show. I mean, if you just don't have good video editors who queue up the highlights fast enough, I mean, all of that stuff can impact how people uh, absorb your organization. Maybe not the diehard fans, but certainly uh, all those things matter. And uh, I think it's important that they're engaged, uh, but there is obviously a gray area where you could become too engaged and, and get a little too heavy handed. Uh, and I would hope that that's not what happened uh, in Portland. I would hope there's some other explanation that we don't know about for uh, those decisions. Um, but, you know, that's, it's definitely a possibility because, you know, the situation is just set up that the people in organization don't really have the checks and balances. I mean, there's nothing holding someone back from doing that. Do you have, uh, did you feel like you experienced any pressure or, you know, uh, it, it, did any of this feel at all prominent or even unhealthy to you? when you were in the Portland environment or does it now since you've been back How did you know, uh, you've been in a lot of locker rooms now looking back, do you feel like you experienced more or less about the normal amount of weirdness here? Uh, I mean, there's obviously some really strange situations that played out over the, the course of my time in Portland. Uh, some of them were just with the past regime. I mean, going back to like some of Larry Miller's press conferences, like uh, when he was, trying to walk through how Brandon Roy's comeback was going to work or if it was going to happen or not. That was, you know, before the amnesty decision. And that was super weird. Uh, he had a press conference where he fires Nate McMillan. He just shows up randomly in a, in a, a track suit to, to, to fire the coach. And it's just like, what? this is pretty strange. Like this is not usually how you would think these kinds of things would go. Um, so there was a good amount of weirdness there. I mean, it really runs the gamut in terms of media relations. Like the Warriors, I would say, like they've won awards in the past for their media relations. I mean, they really go above and beyond. There's some other organizations where you know, they, they like clearly make a point of media outreach. Um, and I think that that's honestly in the organization's best interest to do that. Um, all NBA teams, like if you can keep the media happy, there aren't that many people out there who are really writing with an ax to grind, who are going to burn you for doing that. Uh, and the easier you can make the media's job, uh, the better the long-term benefits for you are as an organization. I mean, uh, I think part of the reason why, you know, clearly it's not as important as Steph Curry's amazing three point shooting, but part of the reason why the Warriors take off as America's team these last couple of years is because you have tons and tons of writers who have had positive organize, uh, you know, uh, experiences with that organization over the last couple of years and their staff who are ready to sing the organization's praises and, uh, and are able to get access to key decision makers to tell interesting stories. And, uh, you know, that just helps sort of their, uh, you know, helps carry their positivity all the way along. There's a few things that have kind of been strange to me. Like, I don't know if you guys saw not too long ago, uh, the Blazers had that tweet, Nike playing Chandler Parsons and showing the, the air ball. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember like five years ago, I got a talking to from the Blazers for putting up a, a clip that was kind of like mocking one of the Blazers players, you know, a very similar idea. Right? I think it was like Raymond Fulton threw a pass out of bounds or something like that. And I just put a clip like that on the internet. And at that point, five years ago, you know, they were very upset about that and, and kind of wanted to talk about, you know, why are you doing this and, and so on. And now five years later, they're doing the same thing on their own Twitter account, but then they're kind of apologizing for it. It's getting a little bit strange. I mean, things like that, uh, you know, are not what I would consider sort of par for the course. I know more and more teams are trying to go the snarky route and, and all that, but that was one situation that kind of weirded me out. But, you know, Dave, you were getting all sorts of emails and calls from stuff we put up, whether, uh, you know, especially if it was about the broadcast crew or, 
whatever else where they would kind of push back on that. Uh, and in terms of my own experience, like, yeah, anytime you're critical, like, especially on air, uh, where they feel like lots of people are seeing it, or if you're critical on social media, uh, number one, you hear about it from the diehard fans immediately. You know, people are pushing back on you right away. But then number two, you know, you might hear about it at the next game. You know, people are asking you, why'd you write this? Or, or uh, you know, why'd you say this? And, you know, it's not like necessarily direct threats, but there's, you know, you, you kind of feel like, oh, people are watching. And I've never understood why people take like a, a tweet so seriously, you know, if you just kind of like put out a little zinger, but uh, some people do. Some people really do. It's not unique to the, the Blazers. I've had that happen with other organizations too, um, you know, and I can't explain it. I mean, people to a certain level, people are human and like criticism stings everybody. And so that could be part of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was at least it's fair share, if not more weirdness, I'd say in Portland. Did, did you uh, ever feel pressure uh, as far as your access, your credentials, your ability to write a story was based on your content and you need not get into specifics if you don't want to just in general, did, did you feel like your access was linked to the stories that you wrote? Um, well, one thing that was frustrating or like just kind of uh, unsettling was just sort of like always being on a game by game credential, you know, and that was kind of, I think their decision was because, you know, Blazers Edge was like an online outlet, um, you know, that's not the same as like the major newspaper. And I understand what they're, what they're thinking there um, because, you know, there are so many online outlets kind of coming in and coming out. Um, but to me, it was always kind of frustrating because like, especially these last few years, like when I cover playoff games or I go around, you know, covering the Clippers and Lakers in, in person, like, there's never any doubt in my mind. Like I never have to think about something like, is there going to be a credential for me? Can I get in the building? Um, and, you know, that was something for years with Blazers Edge where it was like, well, is this going to be something where they just decide to change their policy? And as you guys saw, you know, after I left, like there was a policy change. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, there was, there was more anxiety at that point, but I don't know if that was because I was younger and not as established or, um, you know, there were some other factors behind that. Um, but, you know, it always did kind of feel like, well, uh, that maybe I wasn't on as, as firm of ground uh, as some other people. Uh, but then again, you know, it was kind of a startup website, and I can understand, like, their side, too. I'm not crushing them for that. I just – and that w it's something that I definitely have noticed. Like, I don't really spend a lot of time concerned about credentials these days after spending five or six years – wondering about it on a regular basis right uh last thing uh so isaac Rop had some things to say about neil olshay uh fair unfair whatever we're not going to ask you to judge that but what are your impressions of of neil in general not in a basketball sense but in a in a media sense in a interaction with the environment way um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I used to write it right when he first got uh, hired was uh, I thought some of the stuff that he was saying was just incredibly petty. Uh, you know, it was always, you know, salesmanship type stuff. Uh, he seemed very sensitive to criticism, and that's something that his colleagues have said consistently for years. Um, he might even admit that. I don't know. Uh, he also, you know, strikes me as somebody who is very willing to take the credit, and uh, he's been awful quiet this year <laughs> uh, when things are kind of going south for them. Uh, so, yeah, I know those are sort of my general impressions. I mean, uh, I think for a lot of his decisions, you, you generally can see where he's coming from when it comes to the basketball moves. Um, like even this past summer, which I know a lot of people are upset about and you know, kind of questioned even at the time, most of those moves with the possible exception of Evan Turner uh, as a specific signing, you kind of see the general game plan and, and it was defensible. It made sense. Uh, and you can't say that actually about a lot of GMs around the league. Like we were just debating this this morning of like, who are the worst front offices? And I mean, there's some front offices, like there's just no rhyme or reason to what they're doing. And they've been bad for years. And haven't learned from the mistakes or just continue to make new types of mistakes. Uh, 
so, you know, you got to give Neil his credit for that. Uh, you know, he does have, generally speaking, have a vision. Uh, but I don't know. I guess my my approach to the Portland media, I think, just would have been a little bit different than his. You know, I know that even people who have been, you know, fairly favorable towards the Blazers in recent years are having trouble getting access to him, getting quotes from him. And to me, I thought Kevin Pritchard kind of laid the blueprint for how you should conduct the PR side of that job. Like you're not always going to win. Uh, you know, you're not going to be an 82 and O team, but you have a fan base that is just dying to love the organization. You know, there are tens of thousands of people, if not more who are just ready to drink the Kool-Aid in Portland because they've grown up with the team and you know, it's, it's what they've known. And so, you know, a little sugar can go a long way uh, and a little hope and a little talk about draft picks and foreign players and, oh, man, you know, Victor Colbert is coming over. And, I mean, you know, the smallest little fringe roster moves can be greeted with excitement. Uh, and I think, you know, a, the, for better or worse, the players have sort of been allowed to um, handle the sort of excitement factor. Uh, but I think that they probably could have used a little bit more support. Like you have this down year. Uh, and I think, you know, why should a Blazers fan right now be super upbeat and excited about this or excited about this organization? I mean, what's the message? And it's like I said, it's been very quiet this season. Uh, there hasn't been a ton of accountability, uh, you know, from my, from my perspective in terms of how they're kind of owning up to what may or may not have gone wrong. Uh, and it's really easy for people to tune out in that situation. I don't think it's in the best interest of the long-term uh, uh, you know, future of the organization to have people kind of like coming in and out uh, of contact with your team. Like you want people always locked in and, and willing to stick with people, uh, stick with the team uh, through tough times. So, uh, you know, I think uh, a more positive media friendly approach would really serve the organization's best interests. Uh, being more communicative with key local media members uh, can really help storytelling and help image building. Uh, and if you don't do that, if you restrict that and the team starts to lose, uh, things can backfire really, really quick. And I'm hoping that that's not what we're going to see here over the next six months. Uh, if it continues kind of like this, uh, but I do kind of have that fear, like, you know, it really shouldn't have come to that. Like even uh, a down season where, you know, you're fighting for the eighth seed shouldn't lead to fans being really, really upset and ready to revolt. Um, but if you haven't kind of kept those relationships positive and, and everyone happy, uh, it becomes a possibility that maybe shouldn't, shouldn't be there. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Ben, for being with us. We appreciate your time. Again, Ben's, of course, at SI.com, the crossover, at Ben Golliver on Twitter. And we will talk to you down the road. Maybe this summer after it's all over, we can look back and uh, see how it went. Absolutely. Anytime, Dave. Good talking to you guys. Hey, thanks, Ben. So we are back. Uh, we're here with Dan, Dan Morang. We'll reintroduce you. I know you asked a question or two in there. We haven't heard too much <laughs> from you because we wanted to make room for our guests. But You've heard Isaac. I mean, let's start there. Let's start there because that's the big explosive deal. What do you make of this? You know, when I sit here and just listen, it's really just kind of taking it all in. I I'm relatively new here as far as quote unquote media. So kind of listening and taking a step back and taking it all in and trying to understand where this all comes from. I, I was aware of, some of the things that have kind of come along with being a, a smaller market team and how the media relationship works. But over the past year, I, I've, I've talked to and worked with and, and discussed kind of how this, this whole, I don't even know what to call it, situation kind of plays out in Portland with various media members. And it wasn't that surprising to hear what Isaac had to say. What was surprising was the clarity that, to which he spoke with. And I, I don't mean that to come across that, that Isaac is any, in any way mincing any words or that I think any less of him. It was just that you don't hear this kind of thing come out of a Portland area media member. And that to me was, was really surprising, but honestly, it was really refreshing. 
Yeah, I think in a sense, I mean, uh, a lot of people are saying, well, can we believe this or can we whatever? Um, that to me, I mean, it's less of a question whether or not you agree with someone's personal perspective, more that there is opportunity to say this in a way that's going to resonate, because if this is completely fabricated, it would immediately be shot down from all corners. That's definitely not happening, <laughs> which says that there's something here, even if you're not buying into the story 100%. And you know, I've been in I've been in this media market for a decade now. I mean, I've not been as close to some, obviously, uh, close as some uh, geographically. I have not been as inside as some, although you know, we all live vicariously through Ben for a while. Um, but still, uh, this is not this is not fabricated. Uh, whether or not the details are exactly, you know, the chain of command and all that, and how it happened, of course those lay open to interpretation. But the general point is not fabricated. Um, there, are, there are issues here, and whether those are issues because it's small market, whether those are personality issues, I think the takeaway point for me is fans, okay, fans generally want to think the best of their team, and so they assume when the media says something negative um, or even neutral, that they should up the positive rating a little bit. So you take whatever the media says and ratchet it up plus five, right? It's possible that that's inverted. It's possible that if you look at the uh, texture of the Blazers' progress over the last few years, relatively few people have been saying anything negative uh, the negative stuff has stood out and been easily identifiable, usually decried. It's possible that there are reasons other than the progress of the team why not as much negative is heard, and that maybe our reaction observing this should be, well, maybe not media plus five, but maybe media minus five or media some skepticism. Not that they're not telling the truth, uh, and I don't think any of them would lie, but... I think there's some validity to it's much harder to say something negative in this environment than it is to say something positive. Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about like full on propaganda and, and state run media here, but mm. we're in an area I think that I, I don't think a lot of people really want to get into. I mean, people want to believe that, that everything is on the up and up that people are free to speak their mind, have their own opinions, whether they be critical or positive. And even if you agree with one or agree or disagree with one narrative or another, that it's being spoken freely and uninhibited without any impact being felt by either the person reporting or telling the story or the, the people observing and reading those stories. Yeah. And that's, that's, I would say clearly not true. I mean, that's never ideally true in any form of media. I don't think it's true in sports media. I think Ben got into that so somewhat. And I don't think it's true in Portland sports media. I, I mean, there there obviously is influence. Uh, John Canzano, while we were talking, uh, and I know you guys are going to go hiss, hiss, Canzano. But, you know, uh, again... <laughs> Who, who is the guy and why does he say what he's saying, what forces and stuff? And, and he's at least outspoken. I mean, he at least says apparently what he thinks. Uh, so there's a certain bravery to that. In any case, John Canzano came on the air and said, in essence, you know, Isaac Ropp was dismissed as an example to everyone else. There might be people around here at this website who feel the same kind of way. I mean, it's not uninhibited that if you say something that is not going to jive with the popular line, you're going to pay for it one way or another. Um, the extension, the the question is rather, how much should you pay for it, and what is fair and what is unfair, and that I think is the topic going forward. Less a personal thing and more, you know, what? <laughs> How is the system functioning or not? Yeah, it, it's organizational. I think Ben touched on something that maybe gets to a higher level here in that it has existed for a long time in Portland. And whether or not that's the cause of the market or whether or not it's the cause of the ownership group, and that's Paul Allen and, and Burke Holding and, and Vulcan Media, I, I can't speak on it. I, I don't know. I, I'm not deep enough into that to know where that directive is coming from, if there is a directive, or 
or what exactly the, the case is, the, the thing that, that bothers me is that no matter where it's coming from, it clearly exists. I mean, I've had numerous people over the past 24 hours text, DM, and, and email me about, hey, do you know what's going on here that are media members and, and uh, of like around the country? I mean, clearly it's caught the eye of other people, not just in the small market fishbowl that is Portland, because this is this is a big deal. And it's it's catching the eye in my experience and from my communication, because, again, it's resonating. I mean, it's not catching the eye like, oh, my gosh, we can't believe this. It's like, uh uh-huh. And wow, he said it. Uh, So, I mean, I guess that could be taken to some support for Isaac uh, in terms of his veracity or in terms of he's not making this up. This is not just about one person being fired. He said that when he was on with us. And and I think that is completely accurate, that if it was just about him getting fired, that happens to radio guys all the time. It's a temporary medium and TV as well. But you know, uh, that that's about something more that he really perceives is not right in this market, and we dismiss that at our peril. Now, uh, we, we've also had another development today. Uh, Molly Blue of the Oregonian uh, had uh, Larry Eldritch, I believe, a CSN uh, executive, saying that the, uh, the reason that Rop was dismissed was his choice alone. Uh, ben covered that a little bit. There can be many threads and many avenues. Um, is there anything to that statement other than that's what they had to say? I mean, or, or put it another way, even if everything Isaac said was true, would they have reacted any other way? Yeah, you know, it's kind of crazy. I mean, when you've got a guy like Canzano, who has been in the Portland media market for a long time and says basically whatever he want, wants to say, whether you agree or disagree with him, he's got a platform that he speaks on and he speaks his mind. And he's saying that he has a source in the organization that's saying that Rop was let go basically as a warning to everybody else. If that's even remotely true, and what that says about the current state of not just of, of media, but I, I mean, how to run a business and organization and how you communicate with your customers and your fan base, that's that's terrifying. Well, and this gets to gets gets to the heart of it because there's an argument to be made, that, and people are making it that this is exactly how the Blazers should react. They didn't like something about the way their product was described. They could they should complain about it to the extent they have influence. They should use it. The question being, the the deepest question: What is the purpose of media then? Is media, as as Ben described from the team's point of view, basically an extension uh, of ticket selling? And I know media folks will bristle at that. I don't mean to imply that's true. I'm just saying that from the team's point of view, that's kind of the rub. That's the use of it, that you get the good media pub and uh, you generate excitement and you sell more tickets and you make more money. Or is media the independent watchdog, you know, fourth estate that is uh, supposed to report to its readers and, 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 you know, veritas in all things and investigate and expose and all of that? It's, it's probably neither purely, but is there a point at which it goes too far to one or the other side? Yeah, I mean, at a, at a certain point, it becomes Orwellian, right? I mean, the... You can't hope for this absolutely perfect landscape uh, for media all the time. And, and Ben talked about a team and, and the Warriors, and I've I've heard nothing but you know great things about how they operate. I've heard of of other media members that you know that the, they go out to G, uh, go they go out to dinner with their GMs in the off season and kind of discuss things. And I mean, those aren't things that you see in the Portland market. And and I and these are coming from teams that are struggling in in certain areas as far as record or ticket sales so it kind of touches on what what ben was discussing and how those relationships can change but i also know people that have been in in markets for a long time and they've gone through the ups and downs and really it hasn't changed in that it, it's just one of those things it's it's kind of strange and i apologize my baby niece just woke up and she's crying if that's coming through um, that's okay. I, I thought it was uh, I thought it was the, the organization objecting, but that's a... <laughs> But uh, you can't do that podcast. Yeah, it's right, just anyway. it's just one of those things where I'm literally as I'm sitting here reading these emails and seeing these texts and these tweets 
in listening to these two guys and hearing from other people who will say the same thing but don't want to be on the record about it, it's I'm I'm sitting here with my eyes open and my and my mouth just dropped. I it's it's really hard for me to to fathom that we're at this point right now considering if, if you want to take it back to just basketball the environment that was surrounding this team you know as they went into the playoffs last year right. it, it's it's just such a crazy contrast for me i'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around it all and, and wondering if this is real or not yeah well then these things were not absent last year there was just an absence of talking about it uh it, but look you know where we are. I mean, for our listeners, for our readers, we've generally always been with you, and I think most people will say that. But, I mean, I think with us, we've lived that out. And mostly what I'm concerned about for our purposes is how do we get at truth? And heretofore, I mean, we haven't completely relied on them. There's there's always a, a dissenting group saying this or that writer is horrible and just talks off their butt and whatever, right? So I'm not saying the dependence has been complete, but we've always assumed that what we're getting from quote-unquote media sources is as close to the unvarnished truth as we can get. It seems to me the onus is on us to be a bit more critical about some of that stuff. Like, uh, we, we can't just swallow it whole and, and think now we understand what the team is. We understand certainly a facet of the team. None of it's, none of it's wrong. But the, the, some of that is, well, it's sor- this is not a secret. It's sourced. What you're getting is you're getting a quote directly from the people who want you to believe that what they're doing as decision makers is correct. So everything is going to be explained. You're not going to see many quotes where they dissent with themselves because they, if they dissented with themselves or, you know, they wouldn't make the move in the first place or if they show vulnerability, they feel like they're going to be seen as indecisive and getting eaten alive. So you're going to see every move kind of unfiltered, unvarnished, explained in the best possible way. Is that always the complete truth? I would argue no, nor is it always as close to the truth as we can get. And we just... Something like this it at least makes us more aware of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I hate to use the, the, the term woke because it's so terrible. But I, I think that this whole situation, if nothing else, will open up some eyes to the, the ugly side of this, so to speak. And... Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it'll take make people pause and be a little bit more critical. And I don't mean critical in the sense of, in a negative sense, but critical in that they'll be more decisive. And I don't even know how I want to phrase this. They won't take everything at face value right away. And maybe that's a good thing. And I don't want to be the eternal pessimist, although I kind of am. But you're accused of doing that. <laughs> yeah, this is true. Um, but it's just one of those things where I think even in, in my own personal experience, my own analysis, I've I've always just gone with what I see in in terms of basketball context, and that's from the video analysis that I do of games. That's the analytics. That's the numbers. Things that that I don't think are really while numbers and analytics are open to interpretation, it's not as as volatile as access and quotes and storytelling because, number one, that's not something that I'm good at. Number two, it's not something that I think can be controlled or detailed in a way that, that you can always trust. Yeah, numbers are more egalitarian. But imagine now if somebody was telling you, all right, you can't say that even though the numbers show it, or you believe the numbers show it anyway, uh, because somebody else might get mad. That's the point. I mean, we would be robbed of, you know, at a certain point that becomes duplicitous, and I think it's up to all of us to gauge whether we cross the line. And also, it's up to all of us. If we want a more independent media, 
We have to ask for and celebrate and support that. And what I mean is, whenever someone says something negative about the team, instead of maybe going, you heretics, this is horrible, um, you know, or you're biased or you're media this or stirring the pot or whatever it is, maybe we should celebrate the fact that they can and they dare to say something negative because otherwise you end up with a lot of cream of wheat. Sorry, they're probably a sponsor. Uh, I don't mean to offend you, cream of wheat, but there you go. Uh, you know, mushy cream of wheat stories in a bowl that is just occasionally punctuated by a raisin of goodness. And it's like, eh, that's I don't like that diet. I, I like the good and the bad. And most of all, I'd like it to be honest. So next time someone says something critical of your team, maybe we should think about it a little bit more, celebrate it, say thanks for that, uh, rather than, you know, saying, this cannot be true because eventually we get what we what we <laughs> wish for, except it turns out horrible when nobody can say a thing anymore that doesn't agree with the uh, common line. Anything else you're taking from this? Yeah, no, I, I think that's, that's really the big point that I've come away from this is this: you can't dismiss anything at, the, at face value right now. Um, being critical and, and analyzing these things as they come out um, whether they be a quote from a, a player or um, whether it be a, a press release or, or anything along those lines. And I'm not saying that they're doing this to shape the narrative every single time in every single way and they're trying to manipulate everything. That's in no way, shape, matter, or form what I'm saying. It's just that I think people in general are better served if they take everything in, in context. And, and 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 you have to have the context. There yeah. can't be any more any more lies by omission. Basically, as as Ben talked about, like it's not you you don't necessarily see the negative story. You just hear silence, and then oh well, here's the good thing, or here's the good part about. I mean, this again is what I've argued. There's almost nothing coming out of the Blazers but this in the last four years. Here's the potential for how this might be good. All this cap flexibility. It doesn't turn out good because you didn't actually use it right. You know, so it's, it does. It isn't good, but only all you hear is this has the potential to be good. This has the potential. Everything has the potential to be good. Whether things actually are good or bad is up to debate, and we need to actually have that debate rather than just saying, "Well, here's here's the best way we can sell this." And that's the key: the debate. I think so. That's why we do what we do. And speaking of what we do, we should probably, we're infringing on an hour here, we should probably uh, let our folks get back to their day. We hope you have, uh, if not enjoy, I don't know, I'm not sure that's a podcast you should enjoy, but I hope this this has been illuminating in a sense, interesting. Uh, we'll certainly continue talking about this in the comment section. Don't forget, uh, you still have a little bit of time, I think, to buy, buy tickets, tickets for Blazer's Edge Night. Uh, that's unvarnished goodness. You can send uh, needy kids to see the Trailblazers play. Uh, find that on our website, blazersedge.com. The post is right there. And for Dan Morang, uh, I'm Dave Deckard, and we will see you next time.